Hello, everyone. Uh, Mr. Frisa is back again. Hope you're enjoying your summer, learning about all this great stuff. Um, today is going to be about approaches to psychology. The, you know, the big debate is the nature versus nurture debate. Um, you're going to see this coming over time and time again. Things like personality, intelligence, uh, why we do things. Is it is it because you're born with it or your nature? Or is it because you learn? We're born with a set of genes that never changes. And for generations, there has been debate over nature versus nurture. And whether genes or environment influence behavior more. What does determine our destiny? Is it in the genes? When we are conceived, two sets of genes are joined into one. From that moment, DNA determines certain characteristics. <laughs> the color of our eyes, the texture of our hair, our gender are set. But science has only begun to explore the role genes play in human behavior. Genes may very well determine how we behave in given situations. UCLA immunologist Bill Clark says genes help control how we interpret our environment. You're dealt a particular hand of, of neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter receptors. And again, together with other things, of course, in your biology and in your history, um, it's going to play out uh, differently in different people. There has to be some kind of innate circuitry in place that allows us to create culture and acquire culture and do the learning. But they do not operate without some input. What you choose to learn, how hard you try to learn, and what you do with what you learn, uh, you do have some responsibility. The ability to modify our behavior is what allows us to overcome genetic predisposition. Different genes are turned on and off in different circumstances. Those circumstances, though, may be very subtle. We actually could fool people by pretending we were each other. Consider identical twins born with the same DNA. Same height, same weight, our whole lives. Though raised alike, Nancy and Jana are quick to point out they're individuals. Nancy was always very free-spirited, and I was the one that was a little bit more responsible. You need a push? No. And how much does our upbringing matter? Top of brain growth depends on lots of nurturing interactions in the early years of life. Parents aren't the only aspect of the environment. There's also the surrounding culture. Some believe the strongest social influences exist outside the home. Controversial author Judith Rich Harris says we get our genes from our parents, but are guided by our peers. The children of immigrants don't resemble their parents in the language they speak and even in their culture. They resemble the people they grew up with. A recent study backs this up. It found the greatest influence on whether teens drink or smoke is whether their friends do. As long as you're within the normal range of parenting, um, how your child turns out is, is not up to you, it's up to the child. Child psychiatrist Stanley Greenspan says this attitude can create irresponsible parenting. Let's see you dance! He says genes and environment are like a dance, working together to make us who we are. That's it, good! And maybe the environment sets the constraints just as much as the genes do. If you throw Einstein in a closet when he's a baby because he has some insane parent, he's not going to be smart. He's going to wind up like one of these tragic kids who gets found in a closet. So whether it's parents, peers, or genetic predisposition, it seems our destiny is determined by a blend of factors. Nature is a lock, and nurture has to provide the key for that lock. Scientists continue to study the nature of DNA and how it reacts to environment. As they do, they gain better understanding of the diseases and behaviors that affect our lives. So again, the nature and nurture debate is the extent which particular aspects of our behavior are inherited, um, you know, with, by your nature or your genes or acquired. Okay, just like the video pointed out. So we have different approaches to psychology. Uh, the first approach is your biological approach. Um, they've shown that certain parts of the brain are highly active when listening to music or other parts are active when solving math problems. 
Uh, so a biopsychologist might explain a person's tendency to be extroverted as caused by genes inherited from the parents, and genes affects the abundance of certain neurotransmitters in the brain. It is one of the fastest growing fields in psychology because all the latest discoveries about how the brain works are you know, coming out daily. So you, you, know, you have your evolutionary you know, psychology approach too, and that's your Darwinism. And uh, this looks for psychological traits that might be advantageous for survival. These traits would be passed down from parents to the next generation. This might explain a person's tendency to be extroverted as a survival advantage. Uh, if a person is outgoing, they might make friends and allies. These connections could improve the individual's chances for survival, which increases the person's chances for passing this trait for extroversion down to his or her children. So another one is the psychodynamic, and you'll hear about this guy named uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud uh, throughout the year. And um, basically, the psychodynamic, um, as is previously described, um, the, it's the unconscious mind. The unconscious motives motivate our behavior. So unconscious means it's out of your conscious awareness. So obviously, they believe they understand human thought and behavior. We must examine our unconscious mind through dream analysis, word association, and other techniques. Psychoanalytic psychologists uh, might explain that the introverted person avoids social situations because of a repressed or forgotten or a memory of trauma in childhood involving a social situation. Uh, maybe they were publicly humiliated or embarrassed at school or a party, but doesn't consciously remember it. So those things come out in those different approaches. Okay. Now, another approach is our behavioral approach. And here's a picture of John B. Watson. Um, he, you know, again, Watson uh, emphasized learning, especially person's experience with rewards and punishments. And he focuses on what's called observable behavior. Uh, they, uh, they see all people's behavior as a result of their environment. And you think you have free will. However, everything you do is a result of positive and negative reinforcement. So uh, a behavioralist might explain a person's tendency to be extroverted in terms of reward and punishment. Was the person rewarded for being outgoing? Was the person punished for withdrawing from a situation or not interacting uh, with others? A behaviorist could look at the environmental conditions that cause a, you know, an extroverted response in a, in a personal situation or, or anything of that nature. So our cognitive, it's the way that people think, and they're interested in discovering how people process information in domains ranging from decision-making and interpersonal attraction to uh, intelligence testing and group problem solving. Cognitive psychologists attempt to determine how these components produce complex behavior such as remembering a fact, naming an object, or writing a word. A cognitive psychologist might explain a person's tendency to be extroverted in terms of how he or she interprets social situations. Does the individual interpret others' offers for conversation as an important way to get to know someone or important for his or her own life in some way? To cognitive psychologists, an extroverted person sees the world in such a way that being outgoing kind of makes sense to them. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video right here just to break the video up a little bit. Uh, but as you can see, different ways of viewing different things, for sure.